All right, welcome back to the Blaze Experience, everyone. It's great to be back here with you today, and I'm definitely excited to start a new month with you guys, because the month of July is now over by the time you're hearing this, and we have went into August, and it's a new month for the podcast. And I want to just say up front, I'm really appreciative of all the support that everyone gave in July. July was our best month yet on the podcast, and... I definitely want to strive to have an even better month in August. So thank you so much. July was a great month for us. We had a lot of growth, and I really want to try and take that growth even further in August. So thank you so much, and please you know, keep supporting the podcast as you have been. But thank you very much. But that being said, as far as news for the podcast, I did want to let everyone know I have officially started streaming. I haven't done a lot yet, but I did two or three streams over the weekend. And I will be streaming now. I'm actually going to stream again today, the day this is recording. This is recording on a Tuesday. You won't hear this till Wednesday, so it'll be too late for you to catch the stream. But my ID that I stream with is www.mixer.com slash blaze experience. And always remember, there's no E on experience. So that's mixer.com slash blaze experience. But as far as a schedule, I haven't made an official schedule for streaming yet, but I think what I want to do is at least every Tuesday I want to stream. So this will depend more on whether I work on a Tuesday, like this week I am off on a Tuesday, so I'll be doing a late night stream. Next week, I believe I will be doing a late night stream as well because I'm off. But then the week after that, for example, I am working on a Tuesday, so I will do a stream during the day. So I am going to switch it up a little bit, uh, just depending whether I work or not. But I'm thinking Tuesdays will be the day that I try to stream um, every week. And then beyond Tuesday, I don't have a set plan yet, but I think I'll just try to fit in what I can. But if you follow me on Twitter, if you join the Discord, then you'll get notifications for when I stream. But I'm definitely excited to start streaming. And as far as the YouTube, that's still in the works, but... Uh, The streaming is up now, so, you know, tune into the streaming and let me know what you think. And now, as far as this podcast, this podcast is actually going to be about the Darwin Project again. So we're going to talk about directing in the Darwin Project. I did touch in on this a little bit in the intro to the Darwin Project, but I didn't get into it too in-depth. This will be kind of an in-depth look at directing in the game, which directing is what I'm most passionate about in the game, and... I'm going to go over all the powers you can use as director, which ones I like, which ones I don't like. I'm going to go over the loadout I use for my directing deck. Basically, you get a deck of like cards as a director, and I'm going to go over what cards I use and why I use them. I'm going to go over like my strategy directing and also some like basic general rules that you should use as a director. So that's kind of what we're going to get into today for the most part. I am going to touch on a little bit of news about Darwin Project, but just a couple more items about the podcast before we get into that. I do want to mention one more time, I have my Listen Notes interview that was done by the Listen Notes podcasting site. So that interview will be in the show notes. You can check out that interview and and hear some of my thoughts about my process in doing the podcast and why I do the podcast, and things like that. You can just find out a little bit more detail into the podcast by checking out the interview. And then I also had two more guest appearances drop over the weekend. I had a guest appearance on the We Need to Talk podcast, so I will post a link for that in the show notes. That one was on reality TV this time. Last week's for them was on gaming. It was kind of a bonus podcast I did with them. And then I also did a podcast with the Horrible Gamers podcast. We just talked about some general gaming news, some games we've been playing. So that's definitely worth checking out as well. So I will drop links for those in the show description. And you can check out both of those guest appearances if you'd like to. And then as always, I do want to mention our newest State of the K2 episode will be on Saturday as usual. And this time I actually will announce what I'm going to be talking about. I will be talking about the buildings involved in base building. So basically all your small and large slots that you can use in your base. I'm going to talk about all the buildings you can put in those slots and which buildings are good, which buildings are bad, which buildings you want to use more, and which buildings you could probably forget about. So we're going to go over all the buildings that you can use in your small and large slots. 
So definitely tune into that. I think that'll be a great podcast for everyone to check out. And that being said, we will just jump right into the Darwin Project. So first, we're going to talk about some news with the Darwin Project. All right. So first of all, with the Darwin Project, there was a new patch that released since the last episode. And this new patch was pretty cool because it had a lot of nice new content in it. One of the new things is a new power that you can use as a player. It's basically a new electronic power, and it's called the Ice Bolt. And essentially what the Ice Bolt does is you can use it against your opponent and freeze them. And what they did to try and make it a little bit more balanced is they made it so it freezes them for 4 to 8 seconds. So essentially they want it to have a varied time. And the reason why they did that is because if you know it's 3 seconds every time, you could wait the 3 seconds, have an arrow ready, and then just shoot your opponent with an arrow right after they get un- done him freezing because basically if your opponent is frozen then they are incapacitated and they can't actually do anything so they have no control over anything at all obviously because they're frozen so they're at your mercy if you just have an arrow ready for them but if it's four to eight seconds then the timing could be off you know you could try to shoot them with an arrow in five seconds but it actually takes them seven seconds to unfreeze so they wanted to try and make the timing off a little bit that way to try and protect the player that's frozen because basically what the ice bolt freezing does is it makes your character really cold and you suffer from cold damage and you can almost freeze to death so i haven't actually been frozen myself yet so i can't say how badly it affects you but i would assume it's to the point where if you get an ice bolt used on you then pretty much have to make a fire fairly soon I don't know exactly how soon, because like I said, I haven't been frozen myself yet, but if anyone that has been frozen wants to comment on this and let me know how badly it actually takes down your cold meter, then let me know. But I would assume they wouldn't make it so broken that you immediately need a fire, because that would be pretty broken, but I'd say, you know, within the next 20 to 30 seconds, you're probably going to need a fire, because it's probably going to bring your cold meter down a lot, and then you have you have time to escape and hopefully make a fire when you escape. That's what I would assume the idea with that is. But that being said, they also release a new tile mapping system, which is very interesting. Now, I will say before I talk about what this is exactly, on Xbox, because I play on Xbox, it doesn't seem to be operating the way they intend so far for me. Because basically what the tile mapping system is supposed to be is it's supposed to scramble the map so that every game is different. So essentially, there's nine tiles in the game, like I talked about in the intro episode. But basically, you have like one tile that's like deep snow, one tile that's a lava zone, one tile that's like your middle zone, and they all look the same as they do every map. But what this tile mapping system is supposed to do is, say your deep snow zone, that is usually in the southwest. What it's supposed to do is basically... This tile can be anywhere in the game now. So instead of the southwest, you could see this tile in the northeast. It could be in the total opposite corner. Or the lava tile, which is usually in the southeast, could be in the center. Or the center tile could be, you know, in east. So it's supposed to switch things up. That way every game, the map has a different construction to it. And you don't really know what zone you're walking into as you walk into a new zone. Although... I assume on PC it's working properly, but on Xbox it doesn't seem like it's working properly yet, I would think. Because most of the games I've played, the map looks exactly the same as I'm used to. So I don't know if this is like another patch they have to release to correct the issues with this, but it's definitely a cool concept, and I think it's definitely something worth trying out once they get the bugs hammered out with it. But in the future, they actually plan to expand on this even further. And what they plan to do in the future is have brand new tiles. That way, it changes the map drastically. So you could have, like, this isn't something they said, but just as an example off the top of my head, they could have, like, a desert tile that's completely different than the snow zones you're used to. And all of a sudden, you're walking from, you know, the deep snow zone, and you go into the desert tile. And then after that, maybe you go into the lava tile. So... They could have brand new tiles that change the map up entirely, and you could have tiles that aren't even used. So, like, say they have two brand new tiles come out next month, just for example. Then there's technically 11 tiles in the game that are usable. So each game you play, 
nine tiles would generate and two tiles wouldn't be used. So maybe the lava tile wouldn't even be used. It wouldn't be in your map that time. So it would really change the game up for you because you wouldn't even know what tiles are being used, where those tiles are, and it's really going to make each game different. So I definitely support what they're doing with this, and I think as long as they do it properly, then it's going to be a huge hit for the game because it's going to make every experience with the game different, which I love that. But actually, they weren't even done there. They have a content update schedule they released, and they release uh, what their update schedule is for the rest of the year, basically. And I won't go over each month specifically, but basically the gist is each month there's planned to be an update, which will have some new cosmetics. It's going to have fixes and balances to the game. And then there's going to be interchanging variety of different things. The different things they'll include that interchange throughout the month. There's going to be some combat updates some new tools for players to use, some new show director powers, and some new electronic powers like the Ice Bolt that they just released. So essentially, each month they're going to do three big items. Basically, there's going to be the new cosmetics every month, and then each month they could interchange with either electronics, they could have some show director powers, or they could have a couple of things they release in their schedule that are unique. They have a training room, a quest system, and a progression update, so I'm not sure what those are going to be exactly, but those are three unique items that they have coming uh, this year, so definitely stay tuned for those, and you know, let's see what they are. But So essentially, you're going to get a lot of new content this year, basically, is what, what's going to happen. So stay tuned for all that, and I'm definitely excited to see what they do. And in addition to this, I will also mention, which I didn't mention last time because it's more of an intro episode, but... I do want to mention they have a top 100 tournament that Scavengers basically puts on. Scavenger Studio is the developer for this game. And basically this top 100 tournament, it's on Steam every two weeks on a Saturday. So the last one was not this past Saturday, but the Saturday before that. So it's been like 10 days since the last tournament. But basically every tournament... They take several top directors that are, you know, highly ranked in the game, and they direct the games of the top 100 players. And the top 100 in the leaderboards on Steam are invited to play in this tournament. Unfortunately, the players on Xbox don't really get anything right now. So hopefully they have an Xbox tournament at some point. But I will say, like, this tournament is a lot of fun to watch, honestly. It takes usually about four to five hours, I think, to crown a winner. And... I watched the whole thing like 10 days ago, and it was amazing to watch, honestly. See some of these players play. Some of these players are so good at the game, and it's just insane to watch them actually compete. Now, the winner, they get bragging rights, and they get an exclusive gold helmet that only the top 100 champions receive. And then if you're a top 10 finalist, then basically you'd have to like win or come in second in one of the qualifiers to get in the top 10, then you would get a silver helmet. So usually it starts with about 60 or 70 players because even though they invite the top 100, not all top 100 actually show up. So usually it's been about 60 or 70 that show up. Then they have like six or seven different qualifying games. And the winner of each qualifier gets into the top 10. And then basically they have qualifiers or wild cards after that, sorry. So basically, if there's seven qualifying games, the seven first place winners would get in. And then the three people that had the best score besides those would get in as well. So usually, you know, three second place finishers. But the gold helmet looks really cool, honestly. And if you're very good at the game, I would definitely recommend going for this. But you are going to have some stiff competition for sure. Because in the last tournament, first place was recursive. Second place was a player named Gomenesai, and third place was a player named Tycoonix. And they're basically the top three in the world right now, but I would say Tycoonix and Gomenesai, who finished second and third, they're probably the best players in the world that that I've seen. I mean, the tournament before this one, Gomenesai won, and Tycoonix got second. So they both finished in the top three two tournaments in a row. And pretty much they're always competing against each other, essentially. And if you haven't watched them play, they are ridiculous at this game. I mean, Tycoonix, for example, he can make some mid-air arrow shots that are insane to watch. So 
definitely recommend if you like this game checking out this top 100 tournament because it's so much fun to watch and you know it really it really helps you actually find out some of the better strategies with this game and what the top players are doing that you're not doing so you can kind of better your own game but scavengers hasn't said any word about whether they'll involve xbox in these tournaments at any point but hopefully they do but currently it's only steam players allowed to join these but now that we are through some of that, we can actually talk about some of the directing in Darwin Project. And directing is a lot of fun. I really love doing this because you basically are the catalyst for the game. Essentially, you are the catalyst for what happens in the game. You can either be a catalyst that's going to affect the game in a good way. You can be a catalyst that's going to affect the game in a bad way. But essentially, you are the catalyst that kind of decides what direction the game goes in. And it's very important that you take this responsibility seriously, I would say, because you don't want to be a type of director that's just going to screw people over and kind of laugh at their expense. Like, in my eyes, as a director, you're there to actually enhance their experience and try to make the experience better for them. So definitely, you know, shoot for something like that where you're going to make the experience better for them. And don't just think of, oh, it would be funny to screw this player over. Try to keep things a little fair. You know, if you want to have some fun with it, that's fine. But definitely try to keep it fair. So the first thing we're going to do is go over some kind of basic unspoken rules. The first one is kind of a actual rule. It's basically there's no teaming up with players and helping them more than is deemed reasonable is no good. So, you know, don't team up with people like say by happenstance, it, it'd be really hard to do this, but Say you joined a game and you were the director and your friend somehow got into that game. Don't just help your friend out. Try to keep the game fair. If you actually know a player in the game, then keep the game fair and don't just benefit one player. But also don't you know just attack one player either. If there's somebody you don't like in the game, keep things reasonable. Keep things fair because... They haven't specifically come out and said this, but I feel like if it got bad enough, then scavengers would probably ban you if you teamed up too much, if you actually negatively influence games too often. They haven't officially said that, but I mean, every time you start a game, it pretty much says don't team up, and I think they take it pretty seriously, so I think they take action if you actually go against this enough. But another kind of unspoken rule, which that one was an actual rule, this one is more unspoken, is to kind of use your judgment and just try to keep the match unpredictable, but also fair. So, you know, try and close a zone or something when people aren't expecting it. But what you don't want to do is, like what I've seen that some directors do, is say a player is in a zone and you close that zone. There's only one spot for them to run to and you nuke that next zone. Essentially, you're basically screwing them over because, I mean, they pretty much have very low chance to survive that because if you're closing one zone on them and then nuking the zone they're running to, then there's really not much chance to get out of that. I mean, there are ways to get out of it if you're a really, really experienced player, but for the most part, you're just sentencing them to die, which you don't want to just sentence a player to die. I mean, you want to give them the opportunity to have their own game and to have their own fun and, you know be responsible for their own death. Basically, as the director, what I like to do is not be responsible for people's deaths. You know, I like to facilitate opportunities for death to happen, but I don't want to be the direct responsibility for someone dying. I want to have opportunities for players to die where, you know, I'm causing fights or I'm causing players to move around the map, but I don't want to just, you know, close the zone on someone, and then nuke them, and then they instantly die. I mean, that's not fun for anyone. It's not fun for the player that just died. It's not fun for the players that are still in the game because they have one less player to deal with that they should have had to deal with that player because they should have still been alive. And it's really not fun for you as a director either because as a director, I mean, you want to see an exciting match. How is it exciting if you're just taking a player out without them actually dying? Because they weren't supposed to die there. You just made them die just because you wanted to. So it's really not fun all around for anyone, I would say. So just be conscious of things like that. 
And in that same respect, you know, kind of like I'm saying, don't always target one player and try to kill them on purpose because that's really unfair advantage to the other players. And it's really not in the spirit of good competition. I mean, what I will do is sometimes like say you put a manhunt on someone. It's kind of fair practice if that player survives the manhunt to they're obviously going to get rewards for surviving it, but you might want to give them a little bit of boost later in the game. You know, maybe you give them the warm up later in the game because they're cold or something. You want to try and take things into account and keep things fair. You don't want to always give things to one player and never give them to another player. So just try to keep it balanced and just be mindful that, okay, I helped this player out twice already, so I got to help the other guy out a little bit too. Just try and be mindful of things like that. Basically, what you're trying to do is you're trying to promote entertainment value for the players. And if you're streaming, you're also trying to provide entertainment value for viewers as well. So your viewers aren't going to want to see you just pick on one player or just, you know, try and nuke everyone and kill them all. They're probably not going to want to see that. So you want to make it exciting for the viewers and, you know, create some fights. But you also want to make it exciting for the players and have a match that is definitely fun for them to play in. But kind of another unspoken rule is you don't want to stop fights by closing zones when people start fighting. So if you see two players fighting and you're watching that, you don't want to close the zone because that's all that's going to do is prolong the fight. Because basically, if some people are already fighting, just let them fight. Just let them fight it out. And then if you want to close the zone after the fight's over, that's not as bad. But don't close it while the fight's happening because all that's going to do is... Just prolong the fight and make them run to the next zone and then keep fighting. So really all it's doing is prolonging things. So you, you definitely don't want to do that. You know, just let the fight happen and let whoever is supposed to win come out on top. I will say, you know, the game does close zones on its own. And it is unfortunate sometimes when there is a fight going on and the game picks the zone to close. So it is, is what it is at that point. But you personally, you don't want to be the one to do that. And also in terms of fights, you don't want to give someone an unfair advantage when a fight's already started. So, you know, if someone's just about to win the game or something and you give a bunch of boosts to the next player over, you know, it's not really that fair because the other player is about to win. So at the same time, though, you do want to try and help the underdog a little when the match gets closer to completion just to keep things interesting. But you have to kind of balance it out in your head a little bit because if, say, there's like three or four players left and there's one player that's badly hurt, I might give that player a heal just to, you know, give them a little bit of a chance to actually catch up to the other three players and give them a little bit of a chance to survive. But if there's like two or three players left and they're all in a fight already, it's not really good practice to give someone a heal because if they're all in a fight already, then you should just let it play out and see what happens. There are very rare instances where I have given a heal in a fight, but usually if I do a heal in a fight, it's only for one reason, and that's in duos. If there's a duos game and it's a two-on-one battle, usually I'll give, well, not usually, I would say, but occasionally I will give the player that's by themselves a heal just to make things a little more fair, because if it's two-on-one, then I want to try and, you know, give the player that's by themselves and the underdog a little bit more of a fair chance against the two team because obviously their partner died earlier in the match somehow and they don't have an extra player to help them. So occasionally what I'll do is if they're about, you know, halfway on health or something, I might give them a heal just to make them full health. That way they at least have a fighting chance against this t tag team. So it's kind of like that where you just want to use your best judgment, you know, and keep things fair, but also keep it interesting because it's also not interesting for that two player team to have an easy victory over a single player. You know, I would think like if I was in that two player thing team, I would actually appreciate the extra challenge of, you know, oh, I have to do an extra, you know, one hit to this player because the director just gave them an extra hit of life. So I would think that's a little more interesting because that player that's by themselves, they have one extra hit now that they, have, they can take. And usually that player still ends up dying anyways, but at least if you're giving them an extra chance, you know, at least it's giving them a little bit extra edge to try and actually overcome these odds. And that's kind of what it's about is if there's an underdog, try to give them a chance to overcome the odds, but 
don't make it so unbalanced where you're basically forcing them to or not forcing them but you basically don't want to tip the scales of the game too much so you want to give them a chance but don't tip the scales too much in their favor that it un- that it hurts the players that had already played well because the players that aren't the underdogs they obviously aren't underdogs because they've already been playing well they've already you know earned their place in that game So you don't want to make the underdog the kind of MVP of the game just because you wanted to. So you want to kind of keep it balanced, but give them a little bit of a chance as well. And that's kind of how you want to play things, just to make it fair for everyone involved and provide the best game experience possible. And basically, just as a director, you're responsible for keeping the match interesting while also not making it unfair for any party. So that's kind of what I'm getting at here. But that's being said, that's basically like the unspoken rules and kind of what I try to abide by when I'm playing. So those are kind of the unspoken rules of directing. But now we'll kind of get into my director deck and the style I like to use in directing. So like I said before, basically your director deck is a deck of cards that you can use that all have powers. And these are powers you can use to influence the game. So basically what I currently use, I use two heal three closed zone, one blood moon, one exposed, two electronic, and two warm up. That is my current deck that I use on a regular basis. If I unlock new powers in the future, I might change that up a little bit, but I definitely like how this current deck I use operates, honestly. But just going over those powers one at a time really fast in case you don't know what they do. I mean, the heal is pretty obvious. Basically, the heal I use is the lesser version of the heal. There is a big heal as well. The heal I use gives you 150 HP. There is a big heal that gives you 300 HP, but I don't. I haven't unlocked that one yet. But the 150 HP heal, I have two of those. I have three closed zone, which the three closed zone, that basically allows me to close any zone I want. So out of the nine tiles, I can close three, so... Basically, I usually use one early, I use one in the mid game, and then I use late one late game. Usually when it's down to like two zones left, I use my last closed zone just to pick what the final zone is going to be. The two electronic, these basically place electronic into the game and give players an opportunity to get that electronic, but it also creates fights around the center of that too, so that's kind of what I use it for. The two warm up, if players are getting cold and they're about to die from freezing, then you can use the two warm-ups to warm them up and give them a chance to keep fighting. Now, the Blood Moon, that is basically a power that will let everyone be able to see everyone. So, usually I use the Blood Moon if there's a lot of players, like, kind of clustered together in a similar area, but they don't know where each other are. Usually what I'll do is place the Blood Moon down, and then if there's, like, five players in the same zone, but they don't realize where each other are, they'll be able to see where each other are at. So it doesn't actually track them like you would if you actually track them yourself. But what it does is it kind of makes them think of it as like glow in the dark, basically. If you have something that's glow in the dark, it's obviously going to stand out and be a fluorescent light that glows when things are dark. That's kind of how I see the blood moon, because basically when you place this down, it makes the players that... It makes every player basically have like a glow to them. That way you can kind of see them. You can go, oh, there's a glow over there. Let me go investigate what player that is and go take them out. So that's kind of how I see it. Basically, it makes the players glow in the dark is how I see it. I mean, technically, it's not dark out, but that's kind of how you can picture it in your head if you haven't played before. And then my favorite power in the game. Honestly, this is my favorite power. I love using this power. It's called Exposed. I currently only have one, but if I ever unlock a second one, I'm definitely putting that in my deck. And basically what Expose does is you hover over whatever player you want to expose. So if I use Expose on player 3, for example, and the closest player to player 3, let's just say it's player 7. So what's going to happen is I use Expose on player 3. That is going to expose them to their closest enemy which in this case is player 7. So player 7 will be able to see exactly where they are as if they tracked them. So player 7 will know exactly where player 3 is, and they will have a little tracker on there for a certain amount of time to know exactly where they are. But in addition, it also shows player 3 where player 7 is. 
So basically the player you expose, it also exposes their nearest enemy to them as well. So essentially both players get the same advantage. Both players get a little tracker on each other. And basically what expose does is nine times out of 10, it almost causes an instant fight. And that's why I love it because I love to kind of, you know, get fights going. And I think there's only been, honestly, there's only one time I can remember ever where I used expose and a fight didn't happen. Every time besides that one time, if I use exposed, then those two players have fought. And, and that's what I love about it. I, I guess just the one time I used it and they didn't fight, it was kind of a fluke thing. Like one of the guys just ran away. So I guess he just really didn't want to fight. But, but most of the time it will cause a fight if you use it. And that kind of leads into like the style I use basically because the style I use, this deck, deck is built to create conflict. So essentially what this deck is made for, I designed it to create conflict and keep conflicts happening. So essentially the closed zone, the electronic, the blood moon, and the exposed, I use all those powers to create fights and push people closer together. So basically the blood moon, you know, that will show everyone that's nearby each other where each other is. The exposed, that will directly reveal two players to each other. The closed zone, that is going to be used... What I use those for is to push players closer together. So if there's, you know, two players that are in a zone that's close by to another zone with three players, I might close one of those zones and hope that I can push the players all together. That way there's five players in the same zone. Or if there's one player that's been kind of hiding all map, then I might close their zone and try and force them to get to some of the combat a little bit. And then the electronic, I use the electronic if there's you know, a couple of people that are nearby electronic spot, what I'll do is I'll place electronic down there. That way it kind of creates conflict because both of the players that are close by to that spot, they're going to go for that electronic, not knowing that there's another player over there. So basically what it's going to do is create a surprise situation for them where, oh, I can get this electronic. I'm right near it. And they get there. Oh, shoot. There's another player here. So that's the kind of thing I like to try and do is create conflict. And that's what I use all those players for. And then basically the warmups and the heals, the two warm up and the two heal I have. The only thing I use those for is to basically continue fights. So or to even the playing field like I talked about before. So basically if you know two players are fighting and one player gets really cold and they're about to die from freeze damage, unless the player they're fighting is using snowballs, I'll use a warm-up on that player because I don't want them to die from freezing. I want them to actually finish their fight and see who wins the fight. But if the opposing player is using snowballs, it's not good practice to use a warm-up on them because they're trying to get a snowball kill and make them freeze to death. So you don't want to use a warm-up at that point. But if they're not using snowballs, then I'll probably warm them up just to make things, you know, keep going. And with the heals... Occasionally, I will use a heal as a reward. I don't use it too often as a reward, but if one player got like, you know, say there's like a three-way battle and one player did very well in that battle, they took out both people by themselves, I might give them a heal if they needed it still, just to, as a reward. Occasionally, I use electronic as a reward too. So in that situation, say that player took out two or three players by themselves, they did really well, and I feel like they deserve a reward but they don't need a heal, sometimes what I'll do is drop electronic near them. That way they can get electronic. So I do use electronic and a heal as a reward on occasion, but it's a rare occasion. You know, somebody has to really impress me for me to use electronic or a heal as a reward on them. But typically the heals, if there's like four players left, like I talked about before, and one of them is low on health, I might use a heal like that just to even the odds and make it a little bit more of a fair game. So... That, that's kind of my strategy and kind of how I use my deck, basically, because I basically just use the heals and warm-ups to keep fights going and keep things fair. And then I use the other powers, the closed zone, electronic, blood, moon, and exposed. I use those to create fights and push people together. So that's kind of my strategy, and that's kind of how I play the game as a director, because I just want to create some conflict, keep that conflict going, and provide a great experience for the players that are playing the game. And that's kind of what I aim to do is provide a great experience for them when I play as a director. But yeah, now that I've talked about what I am using, I will talk about the powers that I'm not using and kind of give a little bit into why I'm not using those powers. So the big heal, 
Honestly, the big reason I'm using not using the big heel is mainly just because I haven't unlocked it yet. I haven't unlocked the big heel yet, so if I did unlock it, I'd probably be using it, but this gives 300 HP to the player, so i probably use this if I had access to it, but I don't have access to it yet. So that is the one exception where I'm not choosing not to use it. The rest of the powers I'm going to mention, I'm deliberately choosing not to use them. One of the powers is Gravity Storm. Basically what this does is it takes away the gravity in the map for a certain amount of time. And basically it makes it so players can, you know, jump really high and it just makes for a crazy, you know, kind of moonwalking situation. And the reason why I don't use this is because it, in my eyes, it really offers nothing to the game in terms of competitiveness because all it really does is slow the game down, I think. Because if there's a bunch of people in the same zone, all it does is it makes it harder for them to fight each other because somebody could jump, they jump up really high. It makes it really hard to hit them with an arrow. You know, all it really does in my eyes is it makes the game less competitive because basically everyone has to wait to fight until that ends. You know, there's very little fighting that happens when a gravity storm is going on. I mean, you can use it in the final zone, which is a big no-no because that makes the final fight very hard and it's very difficult for the players. So I definitely wouldn't do that. The only way I can really see to use it maybe is... If there's an underdog player that you want to get out of that area, then maybe you could use it to, you know, help them get out of the area. But why are you going to make everyone else suffer just to help one player, you know, that's an underdog? Like, the better thing to do would be to use another power that I'm not using, which there's another power I'm not using called the speed up. And basically the speed up speeds up a player for 20 seconds, so... With that player base, with that power, what you normally use that for is if you close a zone on someone, you might give them a speed up to help them get out of that zone as kind of, you know, an even playing field because you close their zone, but you're also giving them a speed up. So it kind of evens it out for them. You also might give it to an underdog, like I was saying, you know, if there's a player that's, you know, like one hit from dying, you might give them a speed up so they can get out of a situation and live to fight another day. The main reason I'm not using the speed up just honestly just because there's not many situations where a speed up is going to help create a fight or keep a fight going on and that's kind of what my deck's built for so a speed up wouldn't really fit into my deck because it's not going to help facilitate more fighting so that's why I don't include that one because it doesn't really do a lot to you know get the feel of my deck accurate. There's another power called Crowd Favorite, and basically this one is mainly for Mixer and Twitch streams, and it allows your viewers to vote on a crowd favorite, and, you know, kind of gives them a cheer. Honestly, the reason why I'm not using this is mainly because I haven't been streaming this game on Mixer, so if I did stream this on Mixer, I might include a crowd favorite in there just to have the crowd vote on it, because basically with this game, the crowd can vote on what they want to have the director use their powers on. So like they can vote on a closed zone, they can vote on a crowd favorite, things like that. But that's the main reason I'm not using that, is just because I haven't been streaming this game on Mixer just yet. There's a power called Telepathy. What Telepathy will do is it will allow all the players in the game to speak to each other, no matter where they are. So if you have a player that's in the north of the map, they can speak to a player in the south of the map. Basically, it just... It kind of allows for trash talking if people want to trash talk. So if you have a really talkative game, it can be fun to use this because if there's a lot of people talking, then they might talk some trash to each other and, you know, say, oh, I'm going to come for you. I'm going to the south right now then. And they kind of like ask each other where they are. And if they want to give up their position, that's up to them. But this is more for if you have a really talkative crowd, then this would be fun to use because you get them to talk to each other for a little bit. But most games I've found, there's a couple players with mics, but not enough to really make this power warranted. Because if, you know, you went into a game with 10 people, all 10 of them are using mics and talking, I probably would use this power, honestly, because it's just fun to hear them interact with each other as you watch that. But usually I only get like three or four players with a mic in a game, and it's just not worth it to use this power because it's basically taking up a slot that you could use something else to influence the game better. Another power I'm not using is the nuke. Now the nuke, a lot of people probably are using this still, but 
it technically does, you know, force people to go a certain way because obviously you don't going to get nuked. But the problem with the nuke is all they have to do is leave that zone for five seconds, you know, until the nuke drops and then they go right back in that zone again. So it, to me, it doesn't really achieve your end goal. Your end goal is to create some conflict and to have players fight. And to me, the nuke doesn't serve that purpose because basically all the nuke does is it moves somebody out of his own for a little while and they go right back there because with a closed zone you're closing that zone permanently and that's why i run three closed zones and no nuke because with three closed zones i can do the objective i want i can force someone out of that zone permanently and get them towards the action with a nuke i mean if they're a smart player all they have to do is go to the next zone wait for five seconds for the nuke to drop then go back to where the nuke drop because like, if they want to stay hidden, that's the best way to stay hidden, because think about it. I mean, if I just dropped the nuke there, obviously everyone had to get out of the area. So no one's alive in that area. So if they go right back into that area, there's going to be no players there. So if they're trying to hide, all that does is give them a better chance to hide. So that's not what I'm trying to do, and that's why I took the nuke out of my deck. Now, there's another power called Give Wood. Basically, this gives plus three wood to a player. And honestly, the reason why I'm not using this is mainly just because the deck I'm using isn't really for rewarding players right now. Like some directors will play a style that they're trying to reward players. And that's definitely a viable style to play. I mean, I don't knock that style at all. You know, if you're a director that likes to reward players, then I definitely understand that. But that's just not my style and not how my deck is built. But if you're someone that's trying to reward players, then you might, you know, put two or three give wood in your deck and then you can just give out wood when somebody has a nice kill. You know, you could say on the loudspeaker, all right, next kill gets, you know, plus three wood. And then the next kill you get plus three wood. You can do things like that, which also encourage combat. So yeah, you definitely can use that power to encourage conflict as well, but it's more of a reward than anything. And that's why I took it out of my deck because... It just doesn't give the same feel as the rest of the car rest of the powers that I'm going for for my objectives. My objective is to create fights and to continue fights that are happening. So it's basically just to make an even playing field and to create fights within that even playing field. That's kind of my end goal, and this doesn't serve my end goal as well. Now there's another power called Electromania, and that's basically the same reason I don't use this as well, because what Electromania will do is every electronic site in the game it will activate electronic there so i think there's about i think there's 11 electronic sites in the game because there's one for each zone and there's two that are kind of like centered in the in two areas so i believe there's 11 total basically it's going to place an electronic in all 11 spots and the reason why i don't use this is because in my eyes all it does is discourage combat because Instead of using one electronic to get two people closer together to fight, it unlocks 11 electronics. So basically it unlocks so many electronics that, you know, there's everyone can get one basically. So it's basically a gift for everyone. And if you're a director that likes to reward people, this should definitely be in your deck because it definitely goes with that style. But if I'm not playing that style, there's no point in having this in my deck because... All it really does is create less conflict because there's so many options for people. So if two people were close to one electronic, now there's, you know, five choices for them that are nearby. So they can go to any one of those choices and they, you know, I as a director, you might get lucky and two people might go to the same one, but chances are they're probably going to get one for free. You know, basically there's going to be a bunch of them dropping right next to someone. Oh, oh, I get a free electronic. Great. So that's more hap what happens than not. Occasionally, you'll still get a fight out of it. Most of the time, you don't get fights because it just drops so many electronics down that there's options for everyone, and most everyone in the game gets electronic at that point. So to me, all it does is create less conflict, and it definitely does benefit the players. I mean, you know, everyone gets electronic basically for the most part, but it's more for a director that wants to reward players and they have that kind of style. My style is more to create a fun experience for the players and, you know, create that fun experience by having them compete against each other. And that's how I'm trying to create my fun experience. It's still a fun experience if you want to reward them, but that's just a different type of experience. So I'm going for the more competitive experience. So the last power I'm not using is called Manhunt. And basically what Manhunt does is 
you can put a manhunt on someone and it makes that player visible to everyone and it kind of shines them like a beacon. So that player is basically a beacon and everyone knows where they are. And if somebody kills them, they get great rewards. If the player with a manhunt on them survives, they get great rewards. So basically for two minutes, it makes them, you know, the hunted player in the game. And if somebody kills them and then they claim their hunt, if no one kills them, then the manhunted player, they get rewards for surviving that. Now, technically speaking, this this does go along with the deck I'm using. But basically the reason I'm not using this is because... Manhunt is more of a specific instance. Like, you have to use Manhunt at a certain time or else you don't get to use it. Because a lot of times what was happening to me is I get to the late game, I hadn't used Manhunt yet, and there'd be like three players left. You can't use it at that point because it's too late in the game. The game won't let you use it. Or even if there's like four players left, I think you can still use it with four players left, but it's not as exciting at that point. And... Basically, Manhunt is a power you have to use, I would say, probably with six players left is like the latest you can use it because it really takes away the effect the later you use it. You know, the effect you want is to get a big group of players trying to hunt down that player. And the later you wait to use it, the less valuable it is. So to me, it didn't really seem worth it because basically, if I use it at like with eight players left, with nine players left, something like that then that's great. But the problem for me is I don't want to give someone an unfair advantage. So if I use it with like nine players left, chances are I'm just picking a player at random and throwing a manhunt on them. And that doesn't really seem fair to me because what did that player do to deserve a manhunt? You know, usually what you want to use a manhunt on is if there's a player that's been dominant already in the game and they're doing really well, you want to give them a challenge by putting a manhunt on them that gives that player a challenge because they've already been doing well. It also gets the other players in the game to kind of band together a little bit to try and get that reward. So they can kind of temporarily band together to get that reward. So it definitely creates more competition if that situation occurs. But the problem is, like I said, with final nine or like, ten, you know, just starting the game out of 10 players left, you're not going to know who the favorite is yet. So it takes you a little while into the game to get a favorite. So, like, the best case scenario you could have is the game starts, one player kills two people, there's eight left, then you could put a manhunt on that player that has killed two people. That's probably the best case scenario you're going to have because otherwise there's really no favorite early on. So, to me, if there's no favorite in the game yet, it seems unfair to use the manhunt. And if there is a favorite early in the game, okay, then great, you know, use it, give that player a challenge and see what happens. But the manhunt team's... It just seems a little bit unfair to me. So that's why I don't like to use it too often. I was using it for a certain amount of point, but a lot of games I would just not even use it at all because there wasn't really a good situation to use it, it seemed like. And that's why I took the manhunt out and I put an extra heal on my deck because the extra heal seems like it does more of what I want. So yeah, that's kind of the powers I am using, the powers I'm not using and why I'm not using them. But that gives you a picture of, you know, all the powers you have and kind of what you can do with it as a director. So those are basically all the powers that are available to my knowledge in the game right now. If there's another power that I haven't unlocked yet, then I apologize for not mentioning that. But these are all the powers that I've heard about and seen. So I haven't seen any powers besides this. Well, technically, from very early on videos, like way back in the game, there was a power where you could give somebody invincibility for a couple seconds. I don't know if that power is still in the game because theoretically it could be a power I haven't unlocked yet and you could still give someone invincibility, but I haven't seen it in any recent videos. So it might be something that Scavenger Studio had early on in testing and they took it out in testing because they realized it was, you know, too much of an advantage. So it might be something that like five or six months ago when I'm seeing these videos from five or six months ago, maybe it was in the game in that testing phase, but now they've realized it's not working. So they took it out. I feel like they took it out because I haven't seen it at all in like, you know, the time I've been playing the game, but maybe it's just something that I haven't unlocked yet. So that's, that's definitely possible. But I do want to mention that giving someone invincibility was a power in the past. And I don't think it is anymore, but it, it could still be the game potentially. 
but that being said, you know, you've followed the unspoken rules, you've used your powers, you've directed a great game. Well, now what? You know, now how do you level up as a director? Well, basically how the director prestige and leveling up goes is when a player has been eliminated from the game, they can give the director a prestige card and they have four choices to do so. So say somebody was eliminated in fifth place. They got fifth place. They're out of the game now. When they exit the game, they have the option to give the director a prestige card. And basically, this is kind of a way for them. If you're a great director, if you directed a good game, they can give you a card to help you level up faster because, you know, they like the way you directed. So essentially, it's a way for the players to give you positive feedback. You know, technically, they give you negative feedback by not giving you any card because they don't have to give you any cards at all. I do want to mention, though, I mean, if they give you no cards at all, it doesn't necessarily mean they're giving you negative feedback because a lot of times players could just, you know, click too fast. They click out of the screen too fast and they meant to give you a card, but they just clicked too fast and got out of the screen. Or it could be they just didn't care and, you know, they're kind of indifferent about your directing, so they didn't offer you a card. But it doesn't necessarily mean, like, because there's been games where I get, like, eight prestige you know because you can get up to 10 prestige since there's 10 players there's been games where i get eight prestige cards there's also been games where i got like three cards so it it really depends because i don't think i've ever directed a game so bad where i deserve three cards but you know sometimes people just don't feel like giving a card out for whatever reason so it might not have nothing to do with you so i do want to mention that just in case players are a little offended if they get too few cards so you know Don't be offended if you get too few cards for a game. Just take with a grain of salt. Just move on to your next game and, you know, just keep directing well and eventually you'll get some good cards. But the choices they have to give you are sportscaster. So this is kind of, you know, if you're sportscasting the match more and you're kind of doing the play-by-play like, oh, and another great axe hit. Oh, you know, Johnny draws his arrow back. Johnny shoots his arrow and he connects. Headshot. You know, kind of things like that. That's kind of what I see a sportscaster as more. I'm not the greatest at this. I'm okay at it, I would say. But there's some people that are really great at that kind of style. But if you felt that they did that style well, you could give them that card. If they were the storyteller, you could give them that card. You know, that's more... The storyteller, I would say, is more for... If they were telling the story of the match, like... Okay, we have five players left. Johnny is coming into the zone now what is he going to do you know they kind of make a story out of it and they kind of make believe a little more and create a story out of the game that is the card that i probably get the least and i don't think actually this card that everyone gets the least it seems like because in the leaderboards that one is very low for prestige so it seems like people get that one out very little the wild card i would say that's for a director that kind of changes the match suddenly like if a player thinks it's going a certain way and then all of a sudden oh the director dropped the nuke dang i wasn't expecting that you know i have to get out of here now what am i going to do so it's more for the unexpected moments i would say and basically i would say it's for directors that aren't following a set pattern and they just drop something on you all of a sudden like all of a sudden they drop a manhunt on a player and it changes the entire game That's kind of more what I would say for that. And then the fourth choice, this is the choice that I try to go for. This is kind of the style I like to play. So I, this is what I hope players give me when I end a game is the puppet master. Now, basically the puppet master, this in my eyes is for a director that's trying to force people together. They're trying to make players, you know, do what they want. So they're trying to, you know, go over the loudspeaker and say, Hey, I'll, if anyone goes to the middle, I'll put electronic there for you. You know, it's kind of that's kind of stuff where you're trying to direct players where you want. You're trying to create situations and basically you're pulling their strings. You're pulling their strings and causing them to go where you want. You're causing them to fight when you want. And basically you are the puppet master. And that's kind of the style of director I like to play. And that's basically what I hope for when I get a prestige card. But... You know, somebody like if you play that kind of style, somebody could easily give you the sportscaster card just because. And that is the first card listed. So a lot of times you will get a lot of sportscaster cards. 
just because it's the first card listed. Even There's even been games where like I didn't feel like talking and I didn't use a mic. I still got the sportscaster card, which that theoretically makes no sense because how could I sportscast when I didn't even have a mic on? But just because it's the first card in the lineup, usually a lot of people pick the first card just because it's the first one there. So they just click a button. They're like, oh, I'll give them this one. So a lot of people don't really think about it that much. But to me, if I play as a player and I'm giving the director a card, I try to think about it and give them a card that, you know, most suits the way they played. If they did a good job, that is. But that's basically the four choices that players have for prestige cards. And what these cards do is they increase the number of fans the director has. And these fans are basically fake fans, but they're just kind of a means to an end. So it's basically just the leveling system for directors. So the more, you know, quote unquote fans that you have, the higher levels you'll get. And then as you level up, you'll get more powers. So, like, for example, you when you start as director, when you start your first game as director at level 5, you have two closed zones. But if you level up enough, you'll get a third closed zone unlocked. So, essentially, that's what a lot of the powers are early on. It's like, instead of two give wood, you have access to three give wood now. So, it gives you extra, you know, uses of your current powers. But as you get higher, you do unlock some of the powers that are more exclusive, like, for example, the Manhunt. The Manhunt takes you a while to get that power, so you have to direct a lot of games in order to get to Manhunt. And basically, you unlock powers that are more exclusive, or you unlock you know more uses of the powers you already have. Like, for example, the Exposed power. I only have one Exposed right now. I'm hoping that at some point I level up enough that I get two Exposed, because I would really like to use two Exposed in the same game. But yeah, that's basically how you level up as a director. So, you know... That pretty much covers everything in directing in this game, honestly. Like, we talked about how you level up as a director. We talked about all the powers you use. We talked about some of the unspoken rules. You know, I, I said what my strategy was and the style I like to play. You know, there's definitely different styles you can come up with. And you just want to make, you know, your style your own and play the director job the way you want to play it. But definitely just try to be fair with it however you play. But that's being said, that's basically all we have for this episode, so I hope you enjoyed it. I will say that so far, the Darwin Project doesn't seem like a huge hit with my community currently, so if you do like this episode and you do like me talking about the Darwin Project, then please let me know that, because as it stands right now, I might not do another episode on Darwin Project for a while, or maybe not again, period, just based on feedback I've had from my current community because my current community isn't enjoying the Darwin Project as much. So if you do enjoy it, definitely let me know that, you know, definitely be vocal, definitely send me an email, you know, get in touch with me however you want to get in touch with me because if you're vocal about this and I know you are liking the Darwin Project, I can continue doing episodes about it. But if all I'm hearing is that people are liking hearing about the other games more than Darwin Project, then I'm going to focus on the other games more than this. So I won't say this will never come back to the podcast, but as it stands right now, this will probably be the last episode on Darwin Project for a little while, just because I haven't gotten a lot of positive feedback on discussing this game yet. So it seems that my current community isn't as in tune with this game as they are in with other games I'm talking about. Like, for example, Vermintide 2, a lot of more people in my community seem more interested in that game, so... For example, I might talk about that game more because more people seem interested in that one. But that being said, if you do want to contact me and let me know feedback on this and how you feel about the Darwin Project, you know, if you think it's a great game and you want to hear me more talk more about it, then you can send me an email, theblazeexperience at gmail.com. You can get in touch with me on Twitter, at Blaze Experience, with, that's B-L-A-I-S-E, capital X-P-E-R-I-E-N-C-E. That is also the same exact thing as my gamer tag. So if you want to add me on Xbox Live, my gamer tag is also Blaze Experience with a capital XP. And then you could also find me on Discord as well. We have our own Discord. That Discord will be in the show notes. If you don't find it in the show notes for whatever reason, you can always get in touch with me via Twitter or something. I'll get you a Discord link. If you want to find the podcast, you probably know how to do so by now. But we are on Stitcher. We are on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Blueberry, Podbean, Acast. Radio Public, and many other directories. So just check us out in any one of those directories. If you do check us out on Apple Podcasts, please leave a review because these reviews help us get noticed by more people and 
It helps the podcast grow. So if you are listening on Apple Podcasts, please give us a review. And I do want to mention Podcast New Hampshire again. This is the network we are a part of. You can find more about that network at podcastnh.com. It's a lot of great podcasts in one place. So definitely check it out and find some other great podcasts if you like this one. And like I said earlier in the show, if you want to check it out in the show notes, I will have my Listen Notes interview and links to the two podcasts that I was a guest on, both the We Need to Talk podcast and Horrible Gamers podcast. So I was a guest on both of those. I will leave links if you want to check those episodes out. And then, of course, also, like I said, I started streaming and I will be streaming every Tuesday. It will be either during the day or at night, depending on my work schedule. But I will let everyone know as often as I can, you know, whether it's going to be at night or during the day. But definitely check me out on Mixer.com slash Blaze Experience. I will be streaming on Mixer. So definitely check that out and let me know what you think of the stream. And definitely give me a follow on Mixer as well. But hopefully by the Saturday State of Decay podcast, I will have more of a schedule in mind for streaming than just the Tuesday. So I'm hoping to have a more set schedule in mind that I can let everyone know. So tune in for Saturday's episode, which will be a brand new episode about State of Decay 2. And we are going to talk about the buildings that are involved in your bases. So all the small slots, all the large slots all the slots involved in your bases and we'll talk about all of them and tell you you know which buildings are best and which buildings aren't as great so definitely tune into that episode if you'd like to say to the k2 but that's about all we have for today so thank you so much for tuning into the blaze experience i really appreciate it and i really appreciate everyone for giving the podcast a great month of july and you know this will be the first podcast in august so here's to having a great month again so Let's make August another great month, and thank you so much for tuning into the Blaze Experience.